Van Turnhout. Thank you very much. Um, I move the amendment I've tabled to the court bill today and my rationale for doing so, ministers, with the utmost good faith. And I'd like to thank my independent group colleagues for their support to my amendment. I wish to say from the outset that the issue of court order disclosure of complainants' confidential records, be they medical, psychi psychiatric, or therapeutic, and indeed be the complainant an adult or a child, in the absence of any legislative guidelines, is one of considerable and pressing concern to me. That said, and in no way to undermine the urgency and necessity with respect to adult complainants, I see this bill as an opportunity to introduce legislative provision and clear practice for the disclosure of sexual assault counselling communications of children who are witnesses in a criminal trial. I do want to note the work in this regard and the calls for action by many children's and human rights NGOs, civil society organisations and practitioners in the field of specialised assessment and therapeutic services for children that have been sexually abused. I am grateful in particular to the support and advice I have received from Rape Crisis uh, Centre Ireland and uh, Children at Risk Ireland in understanding the current lacuna in the protection of confidential therapy notes and records and developing the legislative solution I am proposing. I am acutely aware of the need to strike the proper and appropriate balance between one, the right of the accused to procedural fairness in child sexual abuse cases. Uh, the right, secondly, the right of the child witness to privacy, as well as their right not to be re-victimised or unduly traumatised by the criminal justice system, and of course, the public interest. I believe it is wholly compatible with Irish constitutional law, Ireland's obligations under the European Convention of Human Rights, and the best interests of the child to provide in law that the disclosure of sexual assault counselling communications will only be granted by the trial court where the evidence sought has substantive probative value, there is no other evidence which could prove the disputed facts, and the public interest in disclosure outweighs the potential harm to the child. Minister, I'll spend the following few minutes giving an overview of the current law in Ireland, jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights and arrangements in other common law jurisdictions relevant to the arguments I am making in support of my amendment. I do not purport to document each area uh, exhaustively. Uh, first, firstly, because I'm confident that as a legal expert you are au okay fait with them, um, and secondly, as they've been very ably uh, synopsized by the Government Special Rapporteur on Child Protection, Dr. Geoffrey Shannon, in a number of his annual reports, and most recently his fourth annual report, which was published in 2010, which is where I was first became aware of this issue. The conclusion of which, I must note, Minister, was his finding of an urgent need for legislation governing the issue of disclosure of private records such as medical records and counselling notes. The right of the accused to justice and procedural fairness is the cornerstone of the Irish criminal justice system and is principally guaranteed by Articles 43.1 and 43.2 of the Constitution. The European Court of Human Rights provides further guidance with Article 6, which protects the right of the accused to the presumption of innocence and the right to a fair trial, while Article 8 provides a right to respect for one's private and family life his home and his correspondence, subject to certain restrictions that are in accordance with law and necessary in a democratic society. The most relevant restriction in this context being for the protection of the rights and freedom, freedoms of others. The issues at stake here clearly require the balance of what in this context are competing interests. There is a substantial body of jurisprudence from the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg which finds that a complainant's Article 8's interests can be accommodated alongside the Article 6 rights of the accused. The decisions from Strasbourg demonstrate that while the right to a fair trial is absolute, none of its contingent parts of which disclosure is one is itself absolute. A fine example of this can be found in the Dursen and Netherlands 1996, where the court held that Article 8 interests, and I quote, are in principle protected by other substantive provisions of the, con of the Convention, which imply that contracting states should organise their criminal proceedings in such a way that those interests are not unjustifiably imperiled. Against this background, principles of fair trial also require that in appropriate cases, the interests of the defence are balanced against those of witnesses or victims called upon to testify. End of quote. The court here is confirming that while Article 6 is very important, the concept of fairness that it embodies has many possible configurations. 
The practice regarding disclosure orders for third parties has over the last 15 years been considered by many of our fellow common law jurisdictions. The disclosure process settled upon in these jurisdictions range from being governed by judicial rulings in Northern Ireland, legislation in Australia, Canada and Scotland, and a combination of both in England and Wales, of which I've examined all of them. They vary in their application from manifestly weighed in the interest of the accused right to a fair trial in Scotland to a comprehensive codified system for the use and disclosure of confidential records in sexual offences case in Canada to models requiring judicial scrutiny on a case-by-case -case basis as in Australia. Whichever the approach adopted, what is most important is that each jurisdiction has seen fit to debate the balance of rights and public interest considerations and to apply standards governing disclosure non-disclosure and objection to disclosure. In Ireland there is no legislative provision governing disclosure nor have these important issues been subjected to sustained analysis and consideration by the Irish Superior Courts. The matter is particularly crucial with respect to child witnesses who have been the victims of sexual abuse. They are uniquely vulnerable by virtue of their age and the heinousness of the, of the abuse perpetrated against them. As the practice current stands, and my understanding is that therapists over the last number of years, but particularly Minister, I want to note, in the last 6 to 12 months, are receiving increasing numbers of requests from the DPP's office seeking access to therapist notes of children's private and confidential therapy sessions. I have a number of serious concerns. The re-victimisation, a sense of powerlessness, stigma and betrayal at having innermost thoughts and feelings examined by a third party and potentially the alleged abuser. A breach of trust, a betrayal by the therapist, therapy, the therapy process is undermining uh, uh, that a healing potential of therapy. It could also create a conflict between one, seeking counselling, and two, reporting or proceeding with a prosecution. One can argue that the dis disincentive effect of disclosure of personal records will be such a powerful disincentive to report sexual offences, Minister, that's the public interest, I believe, in the pursuit of justice peace, and to seek counselling, the public interest in restoring the child's well-being and ability to function in society peace, that it does seriously prejudice the public interest. Minister, there's a strong-held view by many practitioners in specialised assessment and therapy services for children that have been sexually abused the therapy notes should be privileged outright on the basis that they hold neither material evidence nor information relevant to the proceedings. When one examines the purpose of therapy for children that have been sexually abused, what that therapy involves, and moreover the arrangements these services have in place to manage the process, the rationale for such a privilege is actually very strong. Therapy as a whole is not concerned with making judgments, or assessing the actual veracity of what is shared in sessions. Rather, it is simply a particular kind of human engagement where the exploration of the child's thoughts and feelings at a particular point of time is facilitated. Therapy notes in context, in turn, are context specific. They derive out of therapeutic encounters and are as such concerned with documenting feelings, thoughts, hopes, fears, dreams, not actual facts or material evidence. Ultimately, the aim of therapy is to assist the child in getting back to a life that isn't dominated by the sexual abuse they experience and to equip the child to build trusting relationships. In doing so, the therapist will address patterns of behaviour of responses that have become unhelpful, burdensome, of troubling in the child's living experience. Therapy can also draw attention to healthy responses and coping strategies shown by the child in and out of session. This can involve the use of fantasy and therapeutic play scenarios, especially for younger children, where the child can try out different roles in order to make sense of the abuse they experience. However helpful to the child, therapists are becoming increasingly concerned about how notes describing such a scene might be interpreted in a legal arena and taken out of context. Trust in the therapeutic relationship and the creation of a safe space is paramount to the effectiveness and success of the therapeutic process. It's difficult to envisage how this can be achieved where privacy and confidentiality of these therapy sessions are not sacrosanct. 
I argue that the effectiveness and success of the therapeutic process is an important part of the public interest consideration in restoring the child's well-being and ability to function in society. I could give a number of harrowing examples of the devastating effect the current practice is having on child victims of sexual abuse in their families, including, as I mentioned before, the conflict that ensues between either seeking justice or striving for the healing and well-being of the child. But to speak about them here on the public record, I feel is inappropriate. There is one case I can mention, giving, give, which was given to me at the request of the subject, and one which I find deeply disturbing. It is the reaction of one teenager currently engaged in sexual abuse counselling at the thought of their therapy notes being disclosed to a third party. They said, if they had known starting the counselling process that their therapy notes might be disclosed on, they would never have started the process. Having already started, but now knowing it's a possibility, they are afraid to explore certain thoughts and feelings, thus undermining the therapeutic value. And most upsettingly, they said that the idea of their trauma being scrutinized by others was tantamount to their insides being poked at again. Minister, this is a classic example of the re-victimization I referred to earlier. It's a sense of powerlessness instilled by the criminal justice system in the absence of disclosure guidelines which must be addressed. I note the language of the European Commission in relation to the EU directive establishing minimum standards on rights, support and protection of victims of crime, which were adopted in October 2012. It says one of the greatest tests of the quality of our justice system is how well we treat our victims. Appropriate treatment is a demonstration of our societies. Solidarity with each individual victim and recognition that such treatment is essential to the moral integrity of society. It is therefore crucial not only to combat and prevent crime, but also to properly support and protect individuals who do fall victim to crime. In conclusion, Minister, I think it is important to this debate to understand the management systems, specialised assessment and therapy services employ and their relevance to disclosure. The first phase, which is distinct from therapy, is the compilation of an assessment report where the practitioner will take account of the abuse alleged by the child. This is the baseline account of what the child says happened. It is passed on to social workers and to the guardie where appropriate. It is available to the DPP, and in the context of a criminal child, uh, trial, it is not difficult to see how its content is regarded as relevant information. But then the process moves on into the next phase, away from the who, what, where, and when. Instead, the focus is on therapeutic issues that arise for children in their recovery. If any information arises in the course of the therapy phase that substantively alters the picture in the assessment report, the practitioner will update the assessment report accordingly and pass it on to the relevant social worker and so on. In essence, any information or evidence relevant to a criminal trial for child sexual abuse is already disclosed as a matter of course. The information left contained in the counselling records and therapeutic notes have no material relevance but is the heart and soul of a damaged child. As you said, Minister, earlier, this bill is about addressing issues that have been long ignored. So, Minister, I put it to you that we must bolster our protection of these child, child witnesses, and I offer this amendment to you as a legislative response. So, 